So as, um, as you can see from the title today, we are talking about um, online teaching. And um, you'll see in the title that we are focusing on, on our ESOL learners mobile devices entry two. The reason why we say entry two there is because the examples I'm going to be using today are um, examples that, that um, are suitable for in terms of the linguistic um, characteristics, they are suitable for entry two um, level learners, but the principles and the ideas are very much similar to, um, to, to online teaching uh, for, to, to learners of other levels as well. Uh, also, we are going to focus in particular on ESOL learners and mobile devices because the majority of our learners, uh, of our ESOL learners, uh, use mobile devices to access our, our lessons. So we want to be able to, to adapt our materials in a way that really uh, allows them to follow the, um, it allows them to follow our lessons and be able to actively participate on our lessons. So before we start today, can I very quickly ask uh, all of you today, uh, who has started teaching online? If you've started teaching online, just write yes in the chat box. If you have never taught online, you can type no. Okay, so it seems you're all quite familiar. The majority of you um, say yes. I can see a few no's as well. Uh, in the chat box. That's great, that's great. So those of you who have been teaching online for some time now, I'm sure you will, um, you will see things today, possibly some of the things I'll say, you most probably know, and please feel free to offer your suggestions and share your suggestions and ideas and tips with the rest of the participants using the chat box. And those of you who haven't tried yet, I hope after the end of today's webinar, you feel a little bit more confident with, um, uh, with online teaching and learning. Let's uh, get started then. Let's see what we are going to do now. Uh, so today we will start looking at a traditional, if you like, lesson, a lesson that is aimed at entry two level learners who are um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a physical classroom. So that's why I named it a traditional lesson. We will then have a look at principles uh, that, if you like, guide our decisions when we uh, make a transition from face-to-face -to, -face to digital to online lessons. So what are these key principles that we need to have in mind? We will then have a look at some tools for asynchronous instruction, instruction that takes place at each learner's, um, at each learner's own pace and time. So we're not talking about live classroom, live online classroom time. Uh, then we will look at how to adapt the traditional lesson and we will finish the day with some tools for synchronous instruction, for live um, face-to-face, -face sorry, live face-to-face -face online instruction. So like what we're doing now, uh, of course now, because it's very many of us, we're about 600 people in the room, we cannot have our cameras on, but usually when you have a smaller, Class, you have that sort of face-to-face -face feel because you can see each other. So let's get started. I'm going to start with a sample lesson. This is something I designed um, recently. I had in mind our ESOL entry to level learners and let's see what I prepared for them. So at the initial stage of the lesson, I ask my learners to discuss my timetable of next week. So I'm showing them 
a picture of my, or I share this in the, you know, in the whiteboard or through a projector, if I have, this is from my physical classroom. I share my timetable and I ask them to discuss what they see. What is that I have? If I'm very busy, I will try, I hope that they can start using perhaps language to talk about timetables and language to talk about future plans and arrangements. So I do that usually in open class. We'll see that in detail later. This is followed by a little bit of feedback and language clarification where when I focus on future forms to revise, you know, using the present continuous for future arrangements, um, will for plans uh, and on the spot, on the spot decisions, uh, be going to for plans that are pre-arranged. Le then learners perform a controlled practice task, typically a gap fill activity, a multiple choice activity, where I can see whether they've understood my uh, clarification, whether they are able to use the uh, to use the the target language, those future forms accurately and appropriately. The fourth stage in that lesson is for learners to perform an information gap activity in pairs. Uh, it's like a role play activity where two learners need to work collaboratively to ask and answer each other questions to be able to um, perform this particular task. And finally, the last one, the last step the last stage in this lesson is for, for me to offer a little bit of feedback uh, on their performance and set up some sort of follow-up or consolidation homework activity. So this is a very simple, a very plain um, uh, lesson that I can use. It lasts for about an hour and that's the overview of that lesson. We're going now to explore each stage separately. We're going to explore each stage separately so that later we can start thinking about how to adapt each stage from a face from a from a physical sort of classroom environment to an online classroom environment. Let's have a look. So the first thing that um, I said I was going to do is I would show them my next week's calendar and I would ask them to talk about what they see and what I would project on the um, board in my physical classroom would be this. So this is my um, next week's uh, my, my, my next week's schedule. And uh, I can now invite the learners to talk about it. I can start by asking them perhaps questions. I can say, you know, things like, am I free next Tuesday? And they can say, you know, what my timetable will be like next Tuesday. Or I can ask them for particular, I can ask them about particular um, slots, if you like and uh, they can talk about it. Uh, the idea is for them to start using, or to activate their vocabulary as well, because I have not used words, I've used icons here, but also for, but also for them to start, if possible, to start using uh, uh, language for future plans. Again, if they don't have that language, I don't care, I don't worry. I have already created that mental gap where they understand that they need to use this language. Maybe they don't have it in English, so they know they need it. So later on, when I will start clarifying, they will be better able to grasp the meaning of the target language. So they discuss in plenary mode and I monitor for language. I want to have, a, I want to focus, I want to notice on the language they use. 
because I will use this, whatever I notice, I will use this for um, my next stage. Let's see what my second stage now is. is. Oh, sorry, before I go um, any further, I just want to say that I use this stage, uh, this particular stage to, uh, if you like, to cater, to highlight, to start activating whatever language is relevant to criterion, to assessment criterion 2.2. So those of you who are preparing, those of you who are familiar with um, the ESOL Skills for Life Entry 2 level um, handbook, you would know that assessment criterion 2.2 refers to using straightforward language appropriate for context when speaking. And in particular here, we see language for expressing statements of fact. Yeah. Now, let's move on to the second stage. So, what do I do? I want to provide feedback on that task. I want to sort of give them back. They, they, shared, they shared their um, ideas. And now I want them to be able to, um, I want to give some feedback on task. Remember, at the moment, we're talking about a physical classroom. Okay, we're not talking about adapting this to online lessons, physical classroom. So you can either project or use big flashcards or have your timetable printed and show it to them. So after I give them some feedback, I can start clarifying language. Perhaps they used a future form accurately or they used the future form inaccurately. Whatever the case, I can start clarifying. I can start uh, focusing on meaning, on form, on pronunciation. I can start using timelines to highlight nuances of meaning and perhaps concept questions. So I could use, you know, one of these lovely timelines that Workman has created for us um, to focus on different future forms. And usually I project them if I have a projector or, you know, I can use my computer as well uh, and maybe share my screen um, physically share the screen of my laptop if I don't have a projector or uh, right behind me. The third stage is the controlled practice stage. So I set up a gap fill activity. I can either hand out this gap fill activity if I can print handouts and I can give my learners those uh, handouts. The learners do the task individually. I monitor, I help, I walk around the room. I see maybe someone might, someone might be struggling. Uh, then I can invite my learners to check their answers in pairs and help one another do a little bit of peer teaching. Then I ask them to share their responses and I correct or I, or I confirm as appropriate. Maybe they've done everything accurately, um, so we are ready to move on. Or if they, if they are still struggling with some uh, items, I can correct them. We are moving on to stage four. So now that they've practiced the language in a controlled environment, in that gap fill activity, I now want to give uh, my learners an opportunity to practice using this target language orally, in a freer, in a more meaningful way. So what I want to do is I want to create this information gap activity. 
So I divide my learners. Some learners are student A, some learners are student B. So the first thing I do is I assign roles. I walk around the room. Remember, we are still talking about a physical classroom. I walk around the room and I say, you're A, you're B, you're A, you're B, you're A, you're B. Then I ask them to tell me who is A, raise your hand. They raise their hand, only the A students. And I give them their uh, task sheet. I'll show this to you in just a second. Once they have their task sheet, I ask the B students to raise their hand and I hand them uh, their task sheet. I want them to have a different task sheet because remember, this is an information gap activity. Then I pair them up. So each pair is student A, student B, and they have to talk about, they have to work together to answer, to perform the task. What is this task that I'm talking about? So I give them a different timetable. So student A has a timetable. Student B has a different timetable. The goal is for them, without looking at each other's timetable, the goal is for them to be able to find a day and time to meet next week. So they have to now use the language. They have to start using these future forms to be able to get organized. Things like, what are you doing on Monday at 2.30? So using the present continuous for future arrangements. That's an, that's an example. Now, this activity would help our learners focus on these areas. Again, I'm making, I'm creating a link with the assessment criteria now for the ESOL skills for, skills for life entry too. So we, can, we are focusing on 2.1, using pronunciation to convey intended meaning. 2.2, again, using straightforward language appropriate for context when speaking. 3.1, providing relevant information to others during straightforward verbal communication. And three, sorry, 4.3, obtain. Uh, obtain specific information from others so they have the chance to ask each other question, give information, use appropriate language and correct intelligible pronunciation. The last stage of this lesson, of this uh, lesson that's for the physical classroom, is to do a little bit, feed, a little bit of feedback on the whiteboard, focusing on the learner's language, identifying both correct and incorrect uses of the language, doing some remedial work if need be. So if I see that there is a, need, there is a problem that none of my learners can use, say, uh, will for on-the-spot decisions, then I need to do something on the way. I, need, I really need to work on that before they leave the room. And then I assign um, a homework task. So this is my lesson. This is for the physical classroom. What we are going to do now is we are going to look at how I can adapt this lesson for my online um, classroom. To do that, I need to start from some principles. If you like, some uh, guidelines that I have for myself. This is what I use before I make any sort of adaptation. This is what I keep in mind. And I can use this, I can use these set of principles to help me adapt any lesson at all, any lesson I want. So the first one, everything takes longer when teaching online for the first time. And maybe for the second time, maybe for the third time. Yeah, I think those of you who have 
taught online for some time. I'm sure you agree with this. It takes longer. Second principle. If learners can do something at home, let them do it at home. Do not use live classroom time, live online classroom time for things that can do at home. Usually, usually some institutions, their online teaching program is fewer hours than the face-to-face -face teaching program. But it is expected that you will cover the same amount of material. So it is important to make use of the time the learners have before they come to your class. It takes time. They will, uh, be, they will resist at first. But if you make sure that you do this nicely and in a manner that is engaging and that you try consistently, they might do it. During live class, a very interaction, a very interaction patterns and very task types. So make sure that you have, uh, well, I need to make sure because that's for me. I, make, I need to make sure that I have a variety of interaction type or if interaction patterns. I talk to the learners, the learners talk to me, the learners talk to one another in groups. Then again, they share things with me, I share with them and so on. But also task types. I cannot have the same activity over, the same activity type over and over again. I need to vary it to ensure that learners are engaged and interested in my lesson. And finally, use technology that is simple for them, but most importantly, use technology that is useful for you, that is useful and simple, that you know how to use, that you're comfortable and confident with it. If you manage to use just a little bit of technology per lesson, it means you have better control over it. It means you can focus on other aspects during your lesson. So let's now see how I can use these principles to make, to adopt my lesson plan. The lesson plan I showed you earlier, we will stick with that for today. So this is the lesson plan, exactly. It's exactly the same with what I showed you at the beginning. Yep, they first discuss their, my timetable, then I clarify language, then they do a gap fill activity, then, um, uh, uh, um, then they do uh, an, an, uh, the role play where they talk about their timetable and then some feedback. Now, of these ones, which stage can they do at home? Which is the one thing, the one um, bubble, if you like, that I can get rid of that they can do at home? People say, some people say gap fill activity. Yes. Some, somebody said the first one. Okay, right, okay. The homework, of course, yes. Someone says the presentation. Okay, right. So I'll tell you, I, I think, I, well, basically, I think you can do all of them at home if you want to. But I think what you what is important is I prefer to use classroom time, even if it's online classroom time, for practice. Controlled, freer. I prefer to be able to be live with my learners when they do a practice task so that I can go 
and do some remedial work then and there. I think for me, I prefer to do for my learners to do the teaching, the teaching fronted, if you like, stage. I prefer if they do it at home. So usually in my lessons, I'm not like what I am today, where I, I, I've been talking to you for 30 minutes nonstop. I'm very sorry for that. Usually I want my learners to be able to access that part, the teaching part, if you like, what's traditionally thought of as the teacher-centered stage of the lesson. I prefer my learners to access this on their own so that we have more time in class for practice, for questions, for clarification. So let's have a look. The way to do that is by using a screencasting tool. A screencasting tool, if you are not aware, uh, if you don't know what it is, is a tool that allows me to capture my screen, whatever I show on my screen, and it allows me to add my voice on it. And it records a short video that I can then send to my learners. I use Screencast Omatic. So if, if uh, uh, people, people use Screencastify as well, I see this in the chat room, absolutely. Very, very similar. Um, perhaps, I, I think I use screencast so much because I'm used to it. When I first started using it, I thought it was the easiest tool. And I'll show you here what to do, how to use it. So go to screencastomatic.com and you need to click on launch free recorder. If you can see, my um, this little picture here, it says launch free recorder. If I click on this button, of course, you don't need to do it now. Then this pop up window appears. And what you need to do is you need to click. Yes, I agree. Open screen recorder launcher. So you need to click there and say open. And then what you see is this dotted line that appears around uh, your screen. Yeah, if you see here, it's all around the screen here. And you can drag, you can extend this area, you can make it smaller, you can make it bigger. You have the choice to record your screen, record only your camera or both. So, you, so the learners can see your screen and yourself. And all you do is you click this red button, you click on it, it says record, you record, then you click the same button that it says done. And the um, and then the video is saved on your desktop. So what you can do is on your screen, you can have a slide open with your explanation, with some visual support for your explanation for the target language. You can record it. Yes, it records you speaking at the same time. Exactly. You can start talking. And then the learners, once this is ready, you save it on your desktop and then you can send it to your learners. And your learners can watch your short video that has the, it has captured the clarification of the language. People in the chat box are, are ask. How long should it be? I think not more than five minutes. We need this to be very short. We need this to be very, very short. If it is long, the learners will not watch it. If it is short, 
then chances are they might they might watch it. So if it's nice, short and sweet and clear, they are prepared, they know the rules of the language. So when they start the lesson, when they start the live lesson, you can start with them asking you questions. Maybe they didn't understand something. Maybe they want you to clarify something. Or you can go through it because I know we all have those learners who do not do the prep work. Yeah, so I know that we have those, we have those learners who do not do the prep work. And maybe some learners do it and some learners don't. This is fine. You can start your class with a very quick revision of that video. So those of your learners who have watched it, it's good for them. And those who haven't watched it, they watch it then and there. You can use Zoom record. If you are familiar with Zoom and you, you are very, very, you know, you can do it absolutely. You can use any tool you like. The more tools you know, the better. I think this is a very easy and simple tool to use because not everyone uses Zoom for their lessons. There are some, there are some um, uh, online virtual classrooms that does not allow for recording. That's why I think Screencast uh, Onmatic or Screencastify are very good tools. Those of you who are familiar with Apple products, all Apple products have um, a screencast tool as part of the product. So we have QuickTime Player on our um, uh, desktops or laptops. And we also have a screencast recorder on our phones. Uh, again, if you don't want to share your screen, you can record yourself talking, maybe just voice and explaining a concept before you start the class. So that's one tool that you can use to help your learners access something before your lesson so that you create a little bit of room during your lesson for more practice. Next one. So we saw, we saw that this one is no longer there, no more teaching. So already my lesson can be adapted to this. Instead of five uh, stages, now I have four. These are the same four that I showed you at the beginning. We start with a discussion of the timetable. They do the control practice task, the role play and feedback at the end. Let's focus on how we can adapt our initial stage. So in my physical classroom, I would have my learners discuss my timetable, the one I showed you earlier. I would monitor and I would clarify if necessary. So now what I can do in my online classroom environment is we can all be in our main room. The teacher shares their screen using the screen share function. Those of you who have been teaching for a while are familiar with it. Those of you who are new to online teaching, now we are in the main room. Now we are in the main room. On the bottom of the screen, if you are the host, so not now, if you are the host, you can see a green button. It says share screen, you click on it, and you choose the screen you want to share. So you have your timetable open in the background. And when the lesson starts, you choose share screen, the picture with the timetable, and then all your learners are looking at the timetable in the same way that all of you now are looking at my PowerPoint. So students can use their microphones. And also students can use the chat function to share their, their uh, thoughts about your timetable. 
At the same time, it is important that you take notes of their language. You can use a physical notebook. I have here random pieces of paper around next to me where I use them to take notes of what my learners um, produce because then I can use that later for feedback or I can open a Word document. Those of you who are more comfortable with working online, you can open a Word document and tie and type what your learners, uh, your learners output. You can keep it aside for now and later toward the end of the lesson, you can use it to offer some feedback. So the first, you see the first bubble became a, a square like, it's ready to be used online. What about the second stage? Again, the second stage that we see there, that um, magenta uh, bubble is uh, for the physical classroom where learners would be asked to perform a control practice task, this gap fill activity and me, then I would give them feedback. So how can I change this? How can I adapt this to the online classroom? Because of course, yes, I could show them. I could use the screen share and I could share the, um, the task sheet that has, you know, five gap fills, five sentences with gaps, and they could perhaps uh, write their answers using the chat box. That's fine, it's a little bit boring. So if we can make it a little bit more exciting for our learners, what we can do is we can prepare a Kahoot before the lesson. Are you familiar with Kahoot? Some people say yes, some people say no. No worries, I'll show you one now. No worries, I'll show you one now. So you prepare a Kahoot game. You share your screen with your learners. And your learners answer each question one after the other. So if I may, I'll show you the Kahoot website. This is the Kahoot website here. This is what it looks like. What you need to do as the teacher is you need to log in. Your learners do not need to log in. So I will log in. It asks me to pay. I will not. It says thanks, maybe later. Please click on thanks, maybe later. So here it is, it remembers me, this is me. If I want, I can create a Kahoot or I can search for public, for publicly available Kahoots. So I have one. So if I go to, um, let me see, to Kahoots here. I have created one that I'm going to play with my learners tomorrow for speculation and deduction. If I click here on play, it asks me if it is for a virtual classroom or for self-paced learning. I want to use it in my virtual classroom. I want to use it live with my learners. Player versus player. Yes, we want my, I want my learners to do it individually. If I click on classic, then I'll show you the next screen. Please do not do what the next screen uh, says. I'll just show it to you, okay? Because we're not going to play the game now, but I'm just going to show you what happened. So if I click on classic, I'll turn the music off because it drives me crazy. So this is what I'm going to do tomorrow. 
I'm going to share the screen like I do now with you. I'm going to share the screen with my learners. My learners are going to go to this website address. The only thing they need to do is they need to put this game pin number. And once everybody's in the Kahoot, the game can start. What is the game? They see a question on the screen and four or three or two options. And the learners need to choose the correct option. Then we all see, we can all look at the correct answer. And there is a little bit of a, there is a little bit of a, um, uh, if you like, competition, because they need to be correct and fast. And then you can see their answers if you want to. And they, you can offer instant feedback. So you can use it while you're sharing your screen through Zoom. Yeah, so you share your screen, you share your browser where you have, uh, where you have it on the, um, on your, uh, on, on where you have the Kahoot website and the learners follow. There is no problem people ask about the swapping. They don't need to do all the swapping because you can, you, they can see the questions on their device as well. If you remember, the first screen on Kahoot starts with a question. This is visible through the website that you have as a teacher. But once the countdown, once the countdown starts, they um, can see the questions and the answers. So they can use the screens as well. So that's just one idea. There are other websites that you can use instead of, um, instead of Kahoot to make your controlled practice activities um, more interactive, if you like. Um, one uh, other perhaps um, tool that you can use, those of you who are more, those of you who are more familiar with and more comfortable with teaching online can use um, um, uh, how do you call it? Interactive, uh, active inspire, active inspire. You can check that later on Google. Active inspire. It helps you make your activities interactive. So instead of a matching activity where the learners need to go a little bit of you know pen and paper match activity, they can drag and drop. Hmm? So they can use the platform. Um, uh, in, in a uh, sort of, in a more interactive way. <clears throat> so second one, second stage done, became a square. It's, sorry, a, rec a, a rectangle. So that's ready for my online delivery. What about the third one? The um, information gap activity, the role play with the two different schedules. So what I can do is I can divide my learners in A's and B's. And my tip for any teacher around the world who wants to do this activity is make sure your learners rename themselves from the participants list. If they open the participants list, they can choose their name and they can select rename. So instead of, you know, um, Mary Jones, they are A, Mary Jones, or B, Mary Jones. This will make your life so much easier when you divide them later. So you divide them, you share timetables with students. So maybe if you are using a learning management system, you can share the timetable with your learners. You can use Google Documents. You can use the, sh this, the file share function of Zoom or of your virtual classroom. Student A gets the uh, student A handout. 
student B gets a student B handout. And then you can send them in breakout rooms to perform the role play. Are you familiar with breakout rooms? Do you know how they work? You haven't used it yet, some of you, some say yes, some say no. So this is a function of virtual classrooms where we have the main room that everyone is in now, but we can also open secondary rooms for group work. I have, I will paste here, this is a short tutorial I've prepared. Oh, sorry, that was wrong. Uh, I used Screencast-O-Matic and I prepared this tutorial for you. It shows you how to set up and how to manage breakout rooms. You can also please use our transformative teachers website where we have delivered webinars on how to use breakout rooms. And I know people say we cannot, you know, some of you haven't used it. It's not only for Zoom, no. You can find it on Google Meet. You can find it, Microsoft Team has breakout rooms, but they call them channels. They don't call them breakout rooms. It is available in Google Meet. I'm uh, certain because I've used it two days ago. Um, I will try before the end of today's webinar, I'll try to find a link and I'll share a link that shows how to use breakout rooms on Meet. <clears throat> I'll just paste the link once more here. Right, so this is already um, adapted for my online delivery. And the last bit that I need now to adapt is um, how to offer feedback and how to set up consolidation or homework activities. And my idea is use the whiteboard function of uh, Zoom or of your uh, virtual classroom or share a document by simply opening a Word document and then through the screen share function, share this with your learners and invite them to do a little bit of peer correction, self-correction and so on. And now all the lesson, the lesson, all my stages of that lesson that I started 40 minutes ago, I showed it to you as a face-to-face physical classroom environment lesson. It is now adapted to be an online lesson. And which tools did we see today? I showed you Screencast-O-Matic. Some people said Screencastify. Some people said use Zoom to, to capture your screen and a little bit of audio and share the recording with your learners. We talked about the screen share function of your online classroom. We talked about Kahoot.com for interactive game-like controlled practice activities. We talked about renaming participants' names. We talked about breakout rooms function of the online classroom. And we also talked about the whiteboard function of online classroom as well. Of all these, the, scre the screen share, the renaming participants' names, the breakout rooms, and the whiteboard functions are all part of your online classroom environment. So you don't need to be looking at other resources. You, can, you should only stay with the functions and the affordances that your virtual classroom gives you. The only two new tools that I've presented here 
are the screen screencast automatic for a little bit of flipped learning for the learners to be able to watch a video before your class and Kahoot for some interaction. So we, we have looked at how to use your virtual classroom environment in a way that can make your lessons more engaging and how to use two additional tools. The first one to help your learners access teacher fronted stages like language clarification, like concept explanation at home and Kahoot to make your lessons a little bit more engaging and interactive. So here I have a link to our previous webinars. Please follow that page. There is a list of all the previous webinars we've given um, all the team uh, in, in uh, Trinity College London, where you will find information about other tools, about breakout rooms, about other resources, and how best to use those to make your lessons more engaging. I hope you found this webinar useful. I'll stay here to respond to some of your questions that I see in the Q&A um, box. I, 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 can, I should apologize in advance. I know that I will not be able to answer all your questions, but I'll do my best to answer most of them. So some questions say here, uh, sorry, some, some people, somebody says, how do you screen share where learners are in breakout rooms? So what you need to do is if you're using Zoom, you need to, you cannot share different screens in your breakout rooms. You just cannot do it. Some other platforms allow you to do it. For example, Webroom. Webroom allows you to do it. Zoom doesn't. So the best thing to do is either send the handouts or the materials that you want your learners to use during breakout room activity before the lesson, maybe via email, or project, show the materials when everybody, while everyone is in the main room, and ask your learners to take a screenshot of what they see. And then when you send them to the breakout room, you can check. You can see, they can use, the, they can go back to their picture and check that they have um, uh, the materials and the information you have there. Uh, what else? Yes, I think that answered this question. Um, if you give me one second, I know I promised something about Uh, uh, about breakout rooms in um, Google Meet. And I'm going to, to share here a link with you in the chat box. It tells you how you can activate breakout rooms in um, Google Meet. So that is there. Let's see, um, it's answered. Yes, they are. Uh, somebody asked if learners can take a screenshot on their phone when they are using their phone to participate in the Zoom session. Yes, they can do that, absolutely. Zoom is once they've accessed, once they've entered your room, 
Zoom remains open. It's in the background. So if they need to maybe check their pictures from their phone, they simply go to another application. They go to the pictures application. And from there, they can, they can uh, see the material and go back to Zoom. All right, everyone. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for coming here today. I'm going to see you again tomorrow for our next webinar. Thank you very much. Have a very good evening.